who would claim with our lives what we say and what we do that you are truly Lord of all. Thank you, God. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, be seated, please. Wanted to let you know of a couple quick announcements. Samantha, Sam, she is running our kids' program this Christmas time. And so if your kids want to be a part of a wonderful quick Christmas play, it's going to be held on Christmas Eve right here at 5 o'clock. We're doing things different. As we've grown and our church has increased in number with two different services, we need two Christmas Eve services this year. So our first Christmas Eve service is at 4 o'clock. It'll be a 45-minute service. If you've got a friend that you want to invite to church, be like, hey, you got to put in your time, and it's the shortest one of the year, okay? So come to this one. If you're going to come to any of them, come to the short one. So Christmas Eve, 440 to 445, then at 5 o'clock, the kids who are a part will do their Christmas play to 515, and then we'll have a 530 second service. And so the way that works is we're going to do service, people will clear it out, we'll do our play, and then people can clear out, and then we can make room for a second service. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We're also offering a Christmas Eve service, uh, Christmas Day one, excuse me, at 4 o'clock. So after you've opened up your gifts and you've had your Christmas ham and you're bored and you're wondering, should we spend $82 on Moena at the Dollars Theater or going to the movies or whatever? You're going to spend money on popcorn. You say, no, come and worship the King Jesus. We're going to spend this month celebrating Jesus. And so it's going to be a great time. We started a new series today. And today we're going to be talking about contentment in Christ. It's like the CEO who was overworked, overrun, and needed a break. So he told his office, I'm going to take some time off. And he made his way out to the lake. On the lake, he was going to go fishing, but he saw a man coming off of the lake with just a few fish. He said, wow, you've already caught some fish. Why are you quitting? And the man said, well, I've, I've got enough. I've got enough for today. And the CEO, with his business mind, already put into motion. The gears were running. If this guy could already catch this many fish before I even show up, this is a real fisherman. You should be staying here, sir. You should stay and catch more fish. Well, why? You can catch more than what you need, and you can sell it. You can make a profit. And the man said, well, what would I do then? Well, he said, over many, many years of catching more fish than you could ever need or imagine. You could sell and sell and sell. And then you'd be rich enough to one day retire, and you could fish whatever you want. And that poor fisherman looked at him and said, well, sir, I already do that every day. <laughs> Why would I need that? You know, sometimes we don't understand con contentment because in our minds, we create what contentment could look like. The Apostle Paul writes in the book of Philippians, and this is birthed out of our 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians conversation last week, found in Acts chapter 16 and 17. Paul moving on his missionary journey from Macedonia and into Thessalonica, and in and, and this moment right here, what's birthed is this conversation with this young Philippian church. And if you know anything about the Philippian church, Acts 16 tells us that it's a ragtag group of people, totally different from incredibly wealthy to the poorest of the poor, according to how the world would perceive a person. And, and everybody in between starts this church. And it's this exciting, growing church in Philippi. It's got some influence in this area. Paul has this huge affection for this church. And when he writes the book of Philippians, he writes to a sacrificial group of people. A group of people that have sacrificed their time, their talent, and their treasure for the kingdom of God. And Philippians is a, a great book about joy and contentment that's found in Christ. You know, we're at the holiday season right now. There's a lot of things to be discontent about. I mean, you can go to the mall and try and take your family picture. And you can force your little two-year-old on the lap of a strange man with a beard that smells of cigarettes 
and coffee and say, smile and have a Christmas card moment, right? And, and, and you can get on Facebook and you can look and see on your friends' social media accounts all the fun that they are having and the deals on Amazon Prime that they found that you missed out on. And it's a busy season and you're trying to just keep up with office parties and friends and you're hearing about what other people are getting their kids for Christmas or maybe it's a lonely time of year for you. You're hoping for someone to share Christmas with or it reminds you of a person that you've lost in your life and every time the holidays hit, people are singing joy to the world and you're thinking, not for me today. It reminds me of the one that I miss the most here on earth. And we can become discontent during a season that we're supposed to really be celebrating something. You know, discontentment it's always rooted in several different indicators. When we are discontent, we usually are, are, are grumbling, we're complaining, we've got fear and anxiety that are gripping us. Uh, when we're discontent, we live our lives out of those motivations out of anxiety that bubbles up from the fear of not achieving or the fear of not getting what we think we ought to get, what we feel like we deserve. And so we break the bank at Christmas time to try and appease our fears and our anxieties. We charge Christmas. We try our best to be content and we try it out of our own power. And Paul writes to this church that I think they had some struggles going on. Maybe some of the poorer people in this church were looking up to the wealthy, the, the really wealthy ones who were really giving to this church and charging it. And the, the, the wealthiest person, Lydia, that we know of in this church, she was able to travel back and forth from the east. She had two homes. She had her home and a vacation home and a work home. She was always going back and forth. And so it could have been easy for this group of people to become discontent. And so I believe Paul pins chapter 4 for this Philippian group as well as us today to help us understand where contentment comes from. And it's only found in Christ. It's not in getting that nice watch during the holidays, the one that you can show off that people think, wow, that should be an investment. You're wearing an investment and where people can compliment that watch. It, it, it's not in the new pair of shoes or the new purse that you get. The contentment's not going to be found in getting things. It's only found in the giver, Jesus Christ. And so let's look at Philippians chapter 4. With me real quick. I want to focus in on a couple verses. Look here. Following after verse 10 talks about uh, Paul's joy. It says in verse 11, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. And in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, verse 13 says. Now, Paul writes out, and he says, I know the secret to contentment here. He's going to reveal the secret to contentment in the verses that follow. When we think about areas of our life where we ought to be content. And we look at things like our work life, our family life, our relationships. Like We need to find our contentment in Christ. But I think there's some areas of our life, and I believe Paul would agree as he writes in other letters, that there's some things that we should not be content in. Well, while Paul calls us to this contentment, it's only used in the Greek word this one time in Philippians, and it's in the New Testament, this word of being self-sufficient and okay with one's circumstances. That's what this Greek word contentment means here. There's some things that we should not be content with, like our struggle with sin. We should never say, okay, I'm all right with where I am spiritually. When we say those words, I'm okay with where I am spiritually, we are assuming that God is finished with us, that we're a complete project, 
that we should be put on display for all to see and everyone should follow our lead and mimic our lifestyle because we have arrived. Paul writes in Romans and he says these words in Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 2. It says this, what shall we say then? Are we to just continue in sin so that grace can abound, that it can cover our sin? He says this, no, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Some of us here this morning, we've come into church today and we've actually settled when it comes to our relationship with God and our struggle for sin. We've said to ourselves, this is what we are always going to struggle with. It's always going to be prevalent in our life. It's never going to escape us. This is always going to be a part of our life. But the scripture tells us that sin has no victory over you. It's got no control over you, that the power of God has already set you free from the consequences of sin and its domination over you. In fact, David prayed in Psalms 19. He prayed, God, keep me from willful sins, intentional sins, the ones that I feel like I know is wrong, but I'm going to go do anyway. He says, keep me from them that I might not be dominated or overpowered by them. We should never settle and be content with our growth as a follower of Christ as far as repentance of sin. Maybe today God's brought us here today and we look at this and we say, you know what, there's an area of our life I need to surrender. I need to give back over to Jesus. I need to ask for his freeing. I have allowed myself to become content with my sin. And what it's cost is a pattern of perpetual sin. And so as we look to find contentment in Christ, we can also find freedom from that sin struggle. Well, there's a second thing I want you to see here. We should never be content with the idea of sitting around and being lazy for the kingdom of God. We should never be content with this. We should never say to ourselves, someone else can do that work. That's for others. I've put in my time. I used to do that, and I was really good at it, and now it's time for somebody else to step up. We should never be content with this area of our life. We should never say to ourselves, I, I can get lazy with my impact for the kingdom of God. If we're alive, if we have breath in our lungs, if we have a voice, we ought to use it. For the kingdom of God. All the days of our lives. Look what Titus chapter 2 verses four, verse 14 says. And this is a, a letter written to pastors. And it says that who gave himself for us. This is in response to what God does for us. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all the lawlessness. And to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Who are zealous for good works. We ought to be people because of God's goodness and his grace and his redemptive power in our lives. We ought to be people that are marked by this zeal, like this excitement. This is what drives me. It's what gets me up in the morning. This is what enables me to set out and do my daily living is this love for God that's produced a zeal for his good works. Paul writes in Ephesians also that says that he's prepared good works for you to walk in them. We should never become content with the idea of just sitting back as far as our kingdom impact is concerned. Well, the last one is, is self. <coughs> Philippians 3, verses 12 through 14. Paul says we should always strain to press forward. It says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. Paul is saying, myself. I don't see myself as perfect. I haven't already obtained this, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul wants to keep pressing forward to continuing to grow. God calls each of us to have that same desire in our hearts. 
And it's hard during the holiday season, right? <laughs> because uh, there's all kinds of contentment issues that can creep up into our lives. You know, I, I think work is a really serious issue where we have to find our contentment in Christ. And if you are trying to find contentment in your job, in your work, it's not going to satisfy you. It is not going to fill you up. It's not going to meet the greatest desire of your heart. We were all created to work for God and for the glory of God. Like deep within us is this desire to perform and to act. Like that was a gift from God. But if we worship the gift of God instead of the giver of that gift, we've missed it. And I think this happens all the time. We become discontent. We look at other people's paychecks. During the end of the year, we wonder, are we going to get that Christmas bonus? Was it bigger than last year or smaller? Did we even get it at all? We think to ourselves, can I make a career change? Do I need to shift careers so that I can make more money? We feel like we're the only ones doing anything at work. Can we become discontent? And we struggle with this because we feel like we're carrying the whole load while everybody else floats and rides on our coattails. And so we become discontent, and it overflows into our relationships, right? We, we talk to our best friend on the phone. We get connected with our roommate. So we're at the coffee shop, or we're talking to our spouse, and we just do a data dump from the day of all the things that we're discontent in about our work life. Well, our worth, we can become discontent in our worth. It's usually attached to how much money we make or who we spend our time with, who will associate with us, who will invite us to a Christmas party. So will we be left out? And we become discontent with our work and we think we are lesser than. We forget that we're fearfully and wonderfully made by a perfect God who didn't mess up when he made us. He made each of us as a perfect 10, that we in his eyes are exactly how he created us to be. And he loved each of us enough he placed a value and a worth upon each of us enough that he was willing to sacrifice his son, to give up his precious beloved son, an innocent lamb to die on the cross for our sins. And that's a powerful, significant sign of the worth and value that God has placed on your life. Not only has he freed you from your sins and given up his son as a sacrifice, he's now brought you into the family of God. Imagine being an orphan. It's almost like every kid's movie around Christmas time. It's like the, the Annie storyline just keeps getting repeated over and over and over again in all these Christmas stories. It's always about a young orphan who's got no parents and no hope for Christmas, and someone comes to rescue them and give them Christmas. And we were apart from God before Christ rescued us. We didn't have the family of God to link ourselves to, but because God placed value on us, he adopted us into his family. He's given us a great display by showing us that we are valued. We're called prince and princess. We are co-heirs with the kingdom of God. There's a great worth that God's placed on your life. Our wealth, we become discontent with that. We look at the stock market that goes up and down. We see our 401k, or for some of us, a 401 may. There's nothing in there. It's a hard road ahead of us. We are looking at our investments that didn't come through, but we're looking at how much we make an hour and how our wealth is just not building as fast as we wanted it to. And we stare at the world around us and wonder, how is everybody else getting ahead except us? We're just trying to make it. We become discontent with our wealth. So we go out and we buy that brand new car. Or we buy something that's going to satisfy a temporary need. And we then struggle month in and month out to try and fulfill the commitment that we made financially. Relationships, they go bad or sour during this time. There's unresolved tension within families. And we have to be forced to be put around them. And we either ignore it or we confront it or... We struggle through it, and we can become discontent in the relationship that we have. Think about with your spouse, your significant other. Maybe you've been married for a long time. Maybe you've gone down that road, and the honeymoon is now over, and now it's a sparring spouse instead of a serving spouse. 
You're looking to fight with them over every single little thing instead of trying to serve them because you're discontent. They're not fulfilling a need that you have. They're not fulfilling a desire that you want from them. And you're putting all your eggs into that basket and they can never fulfill what only God can. They will never satisfy. Friends, belongings, the list could go on and on, literally. The areas that we can become discontent in. And Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, he says, I figured out the key to being sufficient with my circumstances. That word content in the Greek, it just means to be sufficient with my circumstances. I know how to abound. And this idea is like an overwhelming, it's like an outpouring. He's got more than he needs. I know how to abound. And in every circumstances, I learn the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's a God who can give you the physical strength to endure the good times and the bad times. Verse 14 says this. Yet it was kind of you. It was kind of you to share in my trouble. And you Philippians, you yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except only you. Paul commends these people. He's applauding them. The end of this chapter and the end of this book is really a way of encouraging these Philippian believers. Because when Paul had this great, mighty missionary journey to go upon, when he had the message that was going to transform the world, change history, alter the future, these other churches couldn't pull it together to sacrifice for him. The churches had said no. The churches were saying, what we have is ours. The churches were saying, I, I, I need more. In order to be content, I'm going to need to hold on to all that God has given me. And Paul commends the Philippians. He's like, you know what? No other church jumped in to help me. But you, you guys supported me in my time of greatest need. I remember when we started Anchor Church, I've shared this story before, but I was given a commission. Go find two and a half churches to support you financially, prayerfully, and with people. You've got nobody. You've got your wife, your two little girls, and your worship leader. That, that, that's not enough. You're going to need money. You're going to need people. You're going to need prayer. So go find them. And I went from door to door to door. I knocked on almost every church that I could think of. I drove from the north to the south through the state of New Mexico, seeking out churches to help support us. Brian's been doing the same. He's got several churches, and I believe that he needs maybe one more big church to come in and help support him with his church plant in Rio Church down in Old Town Albuquerque. And so pray for his church, because they need that big dog to help support them, to carry them through the zero tithe Sundays, because there were several of those in the life of our church. And when that first church said, Jared, we are attaching ourselves to the vision that God has given you, and we believe in the work of Anchor Church to reach people with the gospel of people that we can't reach on our own. And even though we're in the same city, we know that God's going to use you to reach others. They gave. Wow, what an encouragement that was to us, to me. It was a confirmation of what God was doing. And Paul's writing in the Philippians, he says, you know what, you guys are awesome. Well, no one else would give, you gave. You entered into a partnership with me, giving and receiving. Verse 16 says, even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once again. You know, the word partnership here and this next verse that follows shows us and indicates that this was continual. This was not a one-time little gift. This wasn't a, like, ah, oh, I feel really good. I helped out that Paul. He's a great missionary. We're going to put a picture of Paul and our church up on the wall here this week, and we're going to remember what we did that one time for him. Now, this was like, hey, it's really of no benefit to us. We're going to keep on helping Paul. Paul says, when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help. And once again, now, 
Now there's a second time for help. The partnership is continuing, and, and he's connecting with the messenger that is bringing the money to him, and he's now writing them this letter that's going to be delivered to them, and they're going to read these words here. Verse 17, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Now the irony here in this passage is the secret for contentment is found in commitment to Christ and the kingdom of God. And it's really saying, all that I am and all that I hope to be, all that I have, it's, it's yours, God. I'm going to hold it all with a loose, open grip. And so, God, if you want it, you can take it. You gave it to me in the first place. And Paul's writing, he's, he's telling them, hey, you know what? I'm thankful for that gift. But I'm not writing you to say thanks because I, I needed this. I'm writing you to encourage you and to come in you and say, your sacrifice, that was for your credit. That was for your good. What, what you thought might have been a major sacrifice for you, you're seeing finances that could be going to being the feeding of the, the city of Philippi. You, you see the, the finances that could go to take care of the needs of the city of Philippi being sent out, that, that, that really wasn't a sacrifice. That was for your credit. This was for your good. When, when you give to the kingdom of God, it's hard. You're like attached to that money. And you'll say, I, I need that money to find contentment because the money buys me things or, or it buys me experiences. And, and, and you kind of get discontented. So sometimes we hold on to it, and then, and then sometimes we, we end up giving, and we're like, wow, that's a major sacrifice for us. But Paul's saying, hey, when you give like that, it's for your reward. It's to your credit. This, this, I'm not asking you to give for me. I'm actually asking you to give to enjoy the blessing of giving. Proverbs 11 Verses 24 through 25 here. Can you pull it up for me on the screen? Look what Proverbs 11, verses 24 and 25 say. It says, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers in want. Have you ever had a season where you're holding on to your finances and you're not giving to the kingdom of God? And have you found yourself... Just wanting more and more and more. I need it. I gotta get the next paycheck. I gotta pay off the credit card. I gotta pay this down. And, and, and I, oh, I would like to get something else though. When I get this taken care of, then I'll start to give. But that day never comes because you're never satisfied, the scriptures say. But verse 25 says, whoever brings blessing will be enriched. And the one who waters will himself be watered. Paul is writing to the Philippians and saying it's for your credit because if you give, if you give freely and sacrificially and you are content with what you have and the remainder, you are going to see God's abundant blessing poured out upon you. You're going to see that all your needs are going to be met according to his glorious riches that are in Christ Jesus. Let's keep reading in Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, page 982 on the free Bibles that we give out. Verse 18 says, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent. Just think about that, by the way. Epaphroditus, he's the messenger. He's the gift bringer from the town of Philippi. He's the representative. Like, you got to imagine Philippi's trucking, and he's, he doesn't have an armored vehicle, Right? He's walking around with a wad of cash, and he's thinking, am I ever going to get robbed? What's going to happen? And he's, he's all alone. There's no crew with him. There's no entourage. There's no backup coming right here, but he brings the gift, and he says, I've received in full payment. I'm well supplied. I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering. Paul uses this metaphor to go back to Genesis and back to the beginning, the Old Testament sacrifice that would be a sacrifice of offering to the Lord, a burnt offering to the Lord, and that sacrifice that was pure and done correctly. God called that an aroma that was pleasing to him. 
he's using this as a metaphor to say when you give, it's just like a pleasing aroma, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul says that for you who give to the kingdom and the work of God, you're going to be blessed beyond what you could even ever imagine. And it's going to be a blessing that is according to his glorious riches. Now, before you think that this is a lotto ticket and this is the best way to score big on the Powerball and this is the way to tap into the uh, the retirement investments that uh, God has stored up for you. Okay, this is not a a scratch ticket to get rich quick. All right. The context of all this is ministry. It's a heavenly riches and heavenly blessing that we can experience here on earth. And oftentimes that can be monetarily and it can also be spiritual. Every time you give and you do a good work for the kingdom of God, you're storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And the God who receives that gift as a pleasing aroma, who says this person is content with the circumstances that surround them, that they are willing to not hold on and to hoard everything that they've got to try and get more, but they live a lifestyle that gives freely. That person will be blessed according to my glorious riches. There's a few Greek prepositions in the New Testament. And there's a way to describe this concept according to the Greek prepositions, okay? So there's apo, ek, and katea. And these three Greek prepositions, they have this concept of saying, what one is away from. You know, if you look at this verse of scripture in verse 19, it says, according to, you might think of out of or away from, that's how it's translated. To give us this according to. And so this idea is that it's apart from you. That's the first Greek preposition, okay? The second one is, it's just like this. I took the money out of the wallet. There's another concept here in the Greek language. That I'm taking the money out of the wallet and giving that to you. That's out of. This is away from. It's not with me. Out of. But the third one that we see here. In Philippians 4.19, it's according to. It's according to. So it's not just out of God's riches. It's according to the wealth of God's riches. It's the difference between getting a 20 out of the wallet and having access to the wallet. What Paul writes here, he says that my God will meet all of your needs according to his entire kingdom, heavenly wealth. That is significant. It's it's similar in our mind, like the difference between car payments and a purchase. Like the weight of debt that surrounds us when we buy a car and we make payments on that car and every single month we're just paying out of. Versus the one who says, okay, I can just buy the car. And so God is saying, you want to be content. Do you want to know the secret of contentment? It's to live a life that trusts him with everything. Every aspect of your life. And Paul uses a financial example here because we're attached to our money. We're thinking about student loans we have to pay off and kids' college that we want to save for and a new coat because our kids have grown out of last year's coat. And we're thinking about that vacation that we desperately want to take next year. 
were consumed oftentimes and driven by our finances. So Paul says, you want to know the secret of this kind of contentment that can be given to you where you're satisfied with the circumstances around you? It's to give freely, to open your life up to God with an open hand, including your finances. You know, my family, we reap the joy and the benefit of being taught that tithing, being generous, that that is a joy. It's not a have to. It's not some Christian duty that we must do in order to check mark the box to get to heaven. It comes from an overflow of our, our love for God. And we've seen the blessing of giving freely to God. You know, this passage of scripture displays someone who is content. And what we see in this passage, I, I think, gets summed up really well by John MacArthur here, okay? And John MacArthur writes, and he says, the crucial lesson, lessons in contentment illustrated here in the life of Paul may be summarized by five words. <coughs> Faith, humility, submission, dependence, and unselfishness. Those virtues characterize all who have learned to be content. So this Christmas season, when the world is calling you away from contentment and driving you towards discontent living, when you feel like your life's marked by anxiety and fear of the future, where there's grumbling and complaining, may this season be a, be a time where you replace it with faith, where you replace it with unselfishness, where you put your focus back on the one who deserves it. We make Christmas oftentimes about ourselves, but this Christmas season, if you're going to celebrate Christ, learn the joy of being content in Christ. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, and each of us here have our own set of struggles and difficulties, and each of us can relate on many different ways, Lord, to the struggle for contentment, whether that's at home, in our relationships, with our job, how much make money we're making, or what we're going through in our lives, Lord. We can all relate to needing to be content in you. So God, may we leave here today and enter into a Christmas season with contentment. May we be people who accept the circumstances that are around us and we find our satisfaction in you. Lord, don't allow us to falsely put upon our spouse or our job or our bank account the priority of contentment. It will never make us content. Lord, let us fix our eyes on you and live our lives with an open hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you guys so much for coming to Anchor this morning. I want to encourage you at the 9 o'clock service to think about people in your life you can invite back to next week's Celebrate Jesus sermon. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at the history of Christ, and we're going to be looking at some ragtag different groups of people who were part of the lineage of God. And so this is a great time to invite a friend during this Christmas season who might not feel like they measure up to God. And so pray for someone who might bring back next week. We've got some exciting things in store for us this Christmas season. Hope you guys have a great week. We'll see you later.